button. Hi, welcome to Jewish Museum Milwaukee's Conversation Starters series. This is part of a robust online content that we are developing during our current time of social distancing and not being able to get together in person, but so important to talk about all the wonderful things that are going on. So we are here today with Linda Frank, and as the curator of the museum, Molly Dubin, I'm thrilled to be interviewing you. Linda is a local and national volunteer, advocate, leader, wonderful friend of the Jewish Museums. Um, she has written two other books leading up to this third, which we're going to be talking about today, The Nice Little Blonde Girl. So I believe we have a visual there. Fantastic. And the two previous books, After the Auction, and the Lost Torah of Shanghai. And really excited to be talking about this. Um, before we get into talking specifically about this book, maybe you could give us a little bit of a background as to how this series got started. A um, lot of intrigue here. We have the main journalist protagonist, Lily Kovner, who is the Jewish Miss Marple and your alter ego. And she really is the, the narrative thread connecting all of these incredible stories. So maybe you could give us a, a little bit of background on how this got started, and then we can get into specifically talking about the nice little blonde girl. Thank you, Molly, and I'm delighted to be with you. After the auction, the first book, and Lily, the invention of Lily, uh, who became the device, so to speak, uh, really came because I wanted to tell a story based on a story my mother had told me about a man that she met through her father during World War II. Um, the man, like my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was from Warsaw, and he had sort of mysteriously um, made his way to, to New York during the war um, as a as an honorary counsel of the Polish Museum, the Polish, excuse me, I see I'm museum oriented, the Polish government in exile. And he was an art and Judaica collector, um, having left an entire collection in his house in Warsaw that was looted by the Nazis and reamassed it uh, living in this country. And various aspects of this and his relationship with my grandfather, whom he met through business, um, intrigued me. And with my journalist background, I tried for a long time to find more information about him, to write an article. And really, everywhere I turned, doors literally slammed shut. His wife was still living when I started this quest through connections with Sotheby's auction house where I knew they had auctioned some of their art. Um, I asked her for an interview. She turned me down. Other people who knew the name in Judaica galleries, etc., literally shut down when I heard the name. And over a period of years, by the time I got to it, um, I thought, well, I'm going to make up a story that would somehow display this character, but Maybe it was true, maybe it wasn't, and I sort of thought that maybe there was some intrigue involved in him, and that's what it became, and, and Lily really came about because um, in, the, in the first book, he was her surrogate uncle, mm -hmm. and I really felt I couldn't write in the voice of a 96-year-old man. <laughs> So, um, and that was the development of Lily. She became the Jewish Miss Marple, was dubbed that, branded by me in the second <laughs> book, The Lost Torah of Shanghai, which is very much relates to my desire to um, talk about the history of Jews in China and the different threads. Uh, the most is known about the Shanghai Jews who were refugees from Nazi Germany and Poland and Czechoslovakia, et cetera. But um, that is far from the whole story, and even that story is not widely known. Um, the plot in that is probably the most outrageously fanciful, although subsequent to the appearance of the Lost Tour of Shanghai, I got information that had sort of traces that made me think, as usual, truth is stranger than fiction. This third book, The Last Little Blonde Girl, is really about a family story. And I put Lily in the stead of, maybe of me, but also in the stead of a, of a now 80 some year old cousin who lives in Israel, who knew that, who knew this cousin, who is the, pro, the real center of the nice little blonde girl as a child, 
um, was the daughter of the aunt and uncle who, le who left that girl with a Christian woman in what was then, I think still Lvov, Poland, before the Nazis, or maybe already back to Lemberg when the Nazis came. That, that's a city that has had a, 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 a numerous name history, depending on who was in charge. And uh, refound this cousin um, after the Soviet Union fell um, back in what's now known as Ukraine. And um, this cousin uh, had lived a very different life. Um, she now has, there are, she has passed away. I never met her, but um, there too, I really wasn't sure what happened to her. And I'm not sure that anybody who knew her then, who knew her in the family for sure, knew exactly what happened to her after she was left until they picked up the thread later in her married life. And she never told her family that she had been a Jewish child until she was literally on her deathbed. So. Oh my goodness. So there's so many interesting pieces there in terms of particularly your research, which I found, you know, must have been incredibly fascinating. Um, you get into a lot of different areas. Of course, we learn that um, Lily had been placed on a kinder transport. You, you touched on a little bit of that. Um, we get into a lot of looking at, of course, the the looted art, artwork and, and artifacts in Judaica that was taken by the Nazis or, or other families who assumed the homes of Jewish individuals that, of course, we know now um, have surfaced in collections around the world, both private and public. And one of the fascinating things is that Lily, after meeting a, a cousin, um, really embarks on opening this foundation with some inheritance, again, from an, another relative um, in being able to pursue these really interesting mysteries when pieces come to light that have no provenance. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that fascinating research? Sure. Um, for some reason, I'm not sure why, the Nazi art looting um, saga it began to fascinate me as early as the late 80s, early 90s, and um, the book by um, Lynn Nicholas um, that came out in 1994 really preceded, um, which was The Rape of Europa, the name just occurred to me, really preceded what became almost a frenzy in the late 90s of all of this coming to light and the Washington principles that were developed and um, the opening up of museums and, and, and private collectors um, to some degree. Um, the Washington principles are not binding and cases still prop up. Interestingly enough, when my first book after the auction came out in 2010, uh, Lily has only aged five years in the last 10 years. I really wish that were the case. Uh, she's got a neat trick there. Um, but when this book came out, people said, oh, you're ahead of your time, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, Lynn Nicholas, whose factual book and other books came out, were way ahead of me. And, um, and I am friendly with a professor at uh, one of the Claremont colleges, Jonathan Petropoulos, who wrote a number of books about some of the uh, dealers, et cetera, as well as uh, some of the royals in Germany. Um, who were um, very close to Hitler and also had, had art, et cetera. Um, so that I really thought was a theme. And because the first book related to this man from Poland who left, and I have had that verified, who left an art and Judaica stocked mansion in Warsaw and mm. you know, w just before the Nazis came, uh, I thought that that was the, that was the hook. Uh, to, um, to, to use all that research that I had literally before there was the internet and I could go back and find things uh, on Google, I, I had clippings and clippings and clippings, which sounds like, you know, deja vu all over again, and archival things that I, in our, in our moves across the country, I kept moving until I finally sat down and wrote this book. And, and I still think it was a hook. And um, interestingly enough, I have never publicly said the name of this man, partly because of the reaction that I got all over when I tried to find out more information about it. But there's a uh, retired journalist from the Netherlands, a Jewish man whom I've met through friends, 
who wrote a book about his own uh, journalistic pursuit of a Nazi war criminal who was a member of the major art looters. And this man crops up as going back to Amsterdam after the war to get some of his art. So that was the first time I actually saw it mentioned anywhere else, which was really fascinating. And this is only a few years ago. And uh, it, it, it's, I think it's an amazing story. So, so sometimes I think that my, he was kind of a diabolical, you know, deal with the devil person, you know, doing the right, the wrong thing for the right reason. Right. Um, and I sometimes think there's some truth to that. But, right. but so, that art living is going on day by day. And after a certain point, I heard museums kind of lawyered up. And um, it's, it's not as clear cut as it was even 20 years ago that everybody was going to do the right thing. Absolutely, that is so accurate. Some, you know, having realized they have questionable pieces or pieces that were looted um, have done the right thing. Others have not. Right. Um, and I'm sure that will continue to go on. Um, in talking a little bit more about collections, one of the interesting things that I learned you got to do is a little bit of a, a very detailed, um, really behind the scenes tour, if you will, at, at the Israel Museum that, that helped you and, and really formed this character, Michael. Um, right. so, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us about that a little bit and how that helped you. A couple of years, uh, about three, four years ago, I was in Israel and with a group actually as uh, the NCJW study mission, which I was not participating in. I happened to be in Israel at the same time, but they had as a, a special trip tour um, for that group that I joined, um, a, back, a back behind the scenes tour of the Israel Museum. And a big part of it was with Michael Mason, who is the chief restorer, and I think I've actually got blogged about him on my website. He, um, he's, a, he's a lovely, very bright, interesting person. And one of the reasons I made the, the purported um, Talmudic scholarly text uh, into um, a, um, what's, what's the word? <laughs> uh, you know, something with, with words behind it. Uh, a polymphus? A polymphus. A, a palimpsest, a palimpsest, excuse me, um, senior moment, a palimpsest, which is something that looks like something else and then perhaps upside down or behind it, um, it's, there's, there's something really that could be crying out, as in this case it does, sure. um, is because he introduced me to that term and actually gave us some books. And he actually showed the group how he worked on certain old things and one of the most fascinating things that he showed us was the diary of um, Elon, Elon, the first Israeli astronaut who was tragically killed in um, one of the accidents, Elon, Elon Ramon. And mm -hmm. his diary was somehow fetched from the landing site. And the family, his widow, etc., asked the Jewish Museum to try to retrieve some of what's in it. And he was able to do that. I mean, this is probably the most poignant, um, incredible story that he told. I, so I, in I, subsequent I, trips, he and I met again and, and, uh, and he was a really nice technical advisor. And I wanted to give him credit because uh, it, it was a fascinating day. And it was, um, and it was really, it's really been wonderful to get to know somebody so skilled and so dedicated to his work with a truly, you know, scholarly and um, Jewish um, heart going into it. Well, I have to say, I mean, so you did so much incredible research, which really brought so much validity. That's the fun part. <laughs> right. I mean, fun, but also really validated so much of, you know, the accuracy in terms of what you were talking about um, with what goes into discovering provenance and you know, what are some of the stories behind that? Um, so one of the other pieces that must have been fascinating was the travel. You talked about the importance of location, location, location in being able to visualize these narratives. Can you talk to us a little about the, the places you got to go and, and how that really helped you in your journey? Sure, well, you know, as you know, Eli and I love to travel and, and are fortunate enough to do it quite a bit. and. Uh, 
we certainly we've spent a lot of time in the areas of Israel that are in um, both of the, well both of the first two books um, and and a little bit in the yeah it's in all books a little bit Israel's in a lot of the book it's, everything ends in Israel it seems and, uh, and of course we've been to New York a lot which is where Lily and her um, significant other Simon live um, and we even have a building that when we've been to New York we walk past it and even Eli now says oh there's Lily's building uh, it's across from Central Park of course and she lives a nice life. And London figured prominently. We did some walks in the sec in the first book, and of course we've been to China a number of times because of our family. And uh, I really love walking around Shanghai. Uh, I think it's fascinating, and we definitely pointed out all the landmarks in that book accurately. Um, we're, we were caught taking a picture of somebody's, you know, last mansion, um, and the Chinese guard sort of waved us away. Uh, that happens. Mm -hmm. And in this book, um, it, we'd also, we'd been to Vienna. I actually have a great grandmother on my father's side. And this nice little blonde girl is from my father's side, um, who's buried in Vienna and we've been to her grave. But this book going to Ukraine, um, we, uh, we didn't do for a while, but we did. And I said to Eli, okay, we're going to Ukraine. So we went to Lviv and the surrounding area for about five days which may or may not have been enough to get everything totally accurate, but to be honest, it was enough. Um, I, we've been to other places in Eastern Europe. My mother used to say, you know, she never wanted to go to Warsaw. She traveled a lot where her father came from because she felt it was part of the graveyards of, of Europe. Um, we've been to Warsaw, we've been to Krakow, other places. But, um, you know, Lviv was the place I think I felt the most like that. Um, yet I was able to meet the daughter of my cousin, the granddaughter, excuse me, of my cousin and her daughter. And, um, and she, there's also a daughter that I've met, a granddaughter that I've met in Israel. Uh, so yes, the travel's been fascinating. This book also involves the Vatican. And from Lviv, we went to Italy. And sounds like ages ago, because who knows when we're going to do things like that again, but we, you know, we have to be careful and safe. But, and we really, I, I pointed out certain buildings that become the, uh, the bishop, the, the priest's home and the restaurant next to it. Um, I don't know if it's exactly like it, but those things were there. And, um, and we also visited the caves where the massacre came um, in uh, that's, depicted in the book, but was certainly a very real thing among Italians, Jews, and non-Jews. You really do an incredible job with being able to put the viewer in those locations. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit, you also visited the, where the ghetto was in Rome. Is that, is that right? And, and, and how, what does that look like now? Uh, that is an area of Rome, just off the Tiber, that truly is gentrifying, of course. And there's a little bit of Jewish tourism in it, which um, is sort of how I feel about Krakow, um, that there's Jew it's Jewish tourism, maybe not so Jewish, although it is more authentic in, in Rome. The first time we were there, we actually, uh, we had signed up for a, a walking tour through, I don't know, JNF or something, and, but we got there early and we got there, there the Great Synagogue is still in use and there was a wedding party coming out. It was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And when we went on the tour, when, they, when the guide came and we were with one or two other couples on this tour, at the end of that, it ended up at the Great Synagogue. And there was another wedding party coming out and finishing. And so it's still used. I think we probably saw all the, Jew, did all the Jews of Rome that day. And we were inside the synagogue for the end of it. And mm -hmm. at, su su subsequently, Eli found a kippah that he must have put in his pocket that had the names of this Italian couple in the name. <laughs> but it's the shops and it's um, restaurants. Um, a lot of them feature the, the um, apparently typically Italian Jewish fried artichokes. Um, but it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's a gentrifying area like a lot of like the old city of Jerusalem to some degree. But narrow streets, there are plaques here and there where the roundups were. Um, but it's, it's very much, I think, integrated 
into the city of Rome, though there's still a Jewish population. But really still, it sounds like, and like the places in Krakow that you mentioned, or going to Shanghai, these places that have this, this memory, you know, this incredible Jewish memory, whereas there may not be the physical presence or population, there's that palpable feeling right. of the Jewish presence that just lingers. And I, I can't even imagine, particularly being in that cave that you talked to, uh, where that massacre took place, um, how, you know, how significant that must have been for you. Yeah, it's, it's, that is really a dark and scary place. Um, and I think, I, you know, one of the things that I did in this book, you know, I sort of like to start with Lillian and Simon or somebody just in their regular life and being called to action. But the, one of the, this time I started at the, the uh, Timna Park in Israel, which is in the Negev, and it was actually very much funded. It's a JNF project by the Chudno family here in Milwaukee. And we've been there a couple times, and it's just a great, beautiful, natural setting. And there are hieroglyphics there that there are, you know, various interpretations. It's right near what were considered the, the, the mines of Solomon, the copper mm -hmm. mines of Solomon, where I had been as a child and got stuck in the mud, or mm -hmm. the sand, actually, with my family and a guide. And it's very different now. And, um, you know, the hieroglyphics, there are a lot of sayings, you know, are these real? Are they not? Some of that came, some of that information and some of those questions came after I've set the book in, you know, in, I mean, like 10 years ago and the book is set in the nineties. Um, but I sort of wanted, I think I started there because there's a theme of what's underneath and, you know, and what's hidden and what came before. And certainly, you know, it's, I wanted to call it a pal. I thought about calling this book a palimpsest life, but which in a way is the life of my cousin, whose name was Heike, who at least that's what they called her in Yiddish. And she became Sophie. She really did become Sophia by the time she was refound by my family and by the family I knew in Israel. And in this book, she's Hannah and she transforms to Magdalena and then already to so Sophia. And so, you know, I like to think I'm paying some tribute to the real person whom I never knew and um and must have endured if not exactly what she endured in my plot must have endured plenty um and and came out you know to have a family granddaughters and you know people who are are pretty normal and and actually rediscovering their jewishness absolutely so um we, we don't want to to give the the whole mcgill away if it were <laughs> um but we that was in the first book the second book <laughs> right but we talked, was Magilla. Right. <laughs> talked about those, you know, the, the threads of history and we've talked about the, the Judaica piece and the art looting and um, the significance of Lily being put, you know, on a kinder transport and, and how that led her into this other life and really looking, you know, genealogically back, which is very much, again, what, what you're doing here. So, you know, as we're kind of wrapping up our discussion, because we certainly want people to buy and read the book, because there's um, not only an incredible amount to learn, but it, it's, a, it's a great mystery. So, but because this really is, is based on a, a family story, um, maybe we could end with a little bit about, you know, why this is, is a little bit more special, or maybe what the difference is a little bit more with, with, this, with this book. I think one of the differences is that I struggled for a while deciding whether to put Lily into it or to just try to tell the story without her. And actually my developmental editor, Alan Rinsler, who's in Berkeley, suggested I did it as another Lily, maybe because he wants to see the series continue. I'm not sure. And in a way, with his advice, that eased up. But, um, but I think because in some ways, even though I am not a direct survivor child, um, I certainly have many friends who are and know many people. And certainly there were, there were three aunts on my maternal grandfather's side, three of his sisters and their families that we really don't know what happened to. And that's, that really plagues me. And in a way, I think we're all survivors. And I think that, you know, as we honor 
the experience of the Shoah and Holocaust, as well as the experience of Jews throughout the century. Um, just being here, you know, being able to sequester ourselves at home, um, to be healthy and in relatively good circumstances, albeit there's anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, we're all survivors, and that is kind of the story of the Jewish people. And, and I think that uh, this cousin of mine in Israel did write a book uh, in Hebrew uh, about her cousin, and I, apparently she had a similar situation with another cousin on, on the other side of her family. It was also her father's side and this cousin, and um, I had it, I have it. It's a long story, I don't have it anymore. Uh, it would have taken me the rest of my life to read it in Hebrew. And, um, and, and obviously within the family, there's a, there's a, a need and a, a, a real interest in, in, in preserving it. Um, and, um, and especially having met her granddaughters, one who lives in Israel, who made Aliyah with her Ukrainian husband, based on them going back and finding the grandmother's Polish birth certificate from the 1920s. And, and the granddaughter in Lviv, who's a professor, she has a daughter of her own, whom she's now sending to Chabad events, um, which, you know, is what there is there. And, you know, I mean, that's really remarkable that, that these, these people who had no clue that their grandmother or anybody in their family was Jewish. And even when the cousin from Israel came, she had to be referred to her. The cousin wouldn't let her tell the family. She introduced her, but she was known as Cousin Sharona from Israel is her real name. And she was known as Cousin Alexandria from the States, or Cousin Alexandra from the States. And she would call the cousin while she was still living. And, um, and, uh, and, and the, the family would say, oh, she's so considerate, that Cousin Alexandra. What time is it in the States? And look, she's calling at a good time for us. And Israel and Ukraine were on the same, in the same time zone. And she had to keep up this fiction. And, and then finally, before Sophia died, she told her family that she had been a Jewish child. So, you know, I think that these are remarkable stories. And uh, there are, you know, the hidden children is a whole other, there are people who went on the kinder, on the kinder transport, various other things, but the hidden children is a whole other, you know, story of the Holocaust, of the so many stories. Well, I am switching us back here to a side-by-side -side view. Um, as you said, there are so many stories and um, you know, we could spend so much time talking about it. It's just a fascinating book. Um, the research that you put into it, um, it's inspiring in terms of, I think, people wanting to look more into genealogy to learn more about their own families. Um, but I love the, what you said about it being really in dedication to in honor of the survivors. And, um, you know, and it's kind of fitting, as you said, that we're, we're in our homes having an opportunity to maybe spend a little bit more thoughtful time, um, not only reading and researching, um, thinking about our, our families, um, and of course, the, uh, the amazing human spirit um, in, in facing challenges and difficult times. So with that, I just wanna thank you, Linda, for talking with us about thank your you. book. Thank you, Molly. Um, I, I just wanna to say to people, I, I wanna give a shout out to our local uh, bookstore, Boswell because I was supposed to have a talk at Boswell on March 31st. And obviously that's been canceled, but they have, you know, for any book you want, you can still order online and do a curbside pickup. Uh, I did some, I bought some new books for my granddaughter, but they have a real cache of these books in anticipation of the book talk that, that won't be for a while, if at all. And um, if people are inclined in Milwaukee are inclined to do that, they are really a fabulous resource and they've been granted essential business status um, under Gre Governor Evers um, mandate. So it's also available on Amazon, eBooks and in print version, a little shameless plug. <laughs> no, not shameless. We, we love Boswell and you know, for all of us, uh, you know, bookies out there that are, 
so loving some time to read. That's an important right. plug and important service to know about. So again, thank you, Linda, for being with us. To our thank audience, you, thank you for tuning in. And be sure to tune in. We will be doing a conversation starter or a creative collaborative connection piece every week, every Wednesday at 1.30. So we will look forward to exploring more robust content. Until then, stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you.